Good morning, church. So good to be here and worship this morning. Let's stand this morning. Let's sing. If you haven't noticed the last couple weeks, we've been more stripped back. Uh, and it's a chance, uh, especially this month, uh, just to focus and, and just to really simplify things as we, we sing and we get to hear each other's voices even more than usual and, and just focus on God's voice and his will and his way. Uh, as we continue to worship. Um, so let's sing this morning uh, and just give him all the glory. Rumors of the sun of May of the Savior, holiness with human hands, treasure for a traitor, no ear is heard, no eye is seen, the image of the Father. Until heaven came to live with me And she like no other Sings together You are this morning. Let's declare this out. You're my author, my maker, my ransom, my savior, my refuge, my hiding place. Amen. You're my helper, my healer, my blessed redeemer, my answer, my saving grace. You're my hope shadows, my strength in the battles, my anchor for all my days. He's not done yet. And you stand by my side, you stood in my place. Jesus, no other name. Only Jesus, no other name.
Jesus. Amen.
this is my surrender. Amen, let's pray. God, we come before you this morning. We surrender to you. We come into this place from so many different areas of life and situations. But we come with one purpose, and that's because we need you and we want to worship you. And God, without you, we would be lost. We would be just dead. Even if we were alive and on this earth, we would be, our spirits would just be dead because we need you to gain true life and new life. And God, we think back to your prodigal son story, and, and we see that no matter where we've been, no matter if we've squandered our wealth, and we're just at rock bottom, just like the father in the prodigal son story, you are seeing us from afar, and you're running towards us. And God, we, we dwell on that image today because we want to seek you out and run to you and accept the invitation home that you've given us, God. Today, right now, this is our homecoming. We come to surrender to you. We give you all the worship and all the glory because your grace loves us and finds us where we're at. And God, you accept us for who we are and we change because we come into a relationship with you. And I pray that that would happen for each one of us. If it hasn't already, but it, then great. But we want that today. We want more of you. We're seeking you out today. Speak to us. Open our hearts. Speak to our hearts. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we continue today uh, in a time of communion. Uh, we want to do it a little differently. Um, but I want to just share a little bit today as I talked about that song, Make Room. We introduced that last week uh, and what that means to me in this season. It's, it's been a lot. It's been reflecting. It's been looking at my life, seeing areas where I truly just have to ask the question, God, am I making room for you and in my life? And each week we make room in our service to partake of communion. And that's something that is important because Jesus told his disciples to do this in remembrance of me. Every time you gather, do this and remember me. And so this morning we wanna remember his life and what he did for us on the cross. And so uh, I'm gonna play a little bit more and as we come up, uh, you can come forward and you can take the juice uh, and we have it all on the front and if you uh, need if you can't get up, you can't get here, just raise your hand. We have uh, someone in the back that can do that, uh, and we can get that to you. Um, but this is a time that we want to just give God room to work in our hearts, you know, maybe reflect uh, on, on our lives, our walk with him, areas where we need to, to make room. Uh, but most importantly, we do this to remember the price that Christ paid for us, to remember that we serve a God that loves us. So let me pray for us. God, thank you for this time. Thank you that we can take a, t a time away in our week to focus on you even more so than we would while we're busy and we have so many other things going on. But God, we give you our sole focus today and in this very moment. We want to remember what you've done for us. Remember your love that is so steadfast and your grace that is greater than we could ever fathom, God, you love us so well. And we thank you for that. And because of that, we remember what you've done today. It's in your name we pray. You can come forward and partake.
Good morning, Jeff Street. So thankful that, uh, that you were here. Welcome to those of you who are here online. And for those that do not know, um, I'm Michael Malik, senior minister. I actually have a new title, Grandpa. And yes, I know what you're thinking. How can a 40-year-old be a grandpa? But it, it, it happened. Okay. Hey, uh, we're going to continue in our series um, uh, Acts, Thunder, and Lightning. If you have your Bibles, open them up. I want to just get right into reading the Word. If you have an electronic device, a phone, an, a, a pad, whatever it, it may be, you can turn that on. If not, uh, the Scripture verses will be up on the screen, and so um, you can just uh, look up there. But I want to continue for us reading in Acts chapter 5, a little bit lengthier of verse uh, today, a passage today, but verses 17 all the way through 42, okay? Acts 5, 17 through 42, and then we'll pray in one moment. So let's read God's word. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in prison, so they returned and reported, We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone called uh, and told them, Look! The men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, And you are intent to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thudius rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed with him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, for if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Let's pray. God, we again are grateful to be in your house, to be amongst believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. And God, we come before you thanking thanking you for the grace that you bestow upon each and every one of us. Jesus, you willingly came to this earth to save us and to show us the way to your Father. 
But you also came and you commissioned us to go out into the world to the ends of the earth to share your message. Help us, God. Help us to submit our hearts and our lives to your commands. May your purposes control our affections and may it mold our understanding. Unite us to yourself so that nothing, even the most fierce opposition, will not cause us to draw back from you, but only help us to come closer to you. God, these things we pray in the glorious name of Jesus, for his glory and for his honor, and all of God's people say, amen. Well, as we go through the book of Acts, I think last week I was mentioning to you about this idea that the church was continuing to grow. Matter of fact, in Acts chapter 5, verse 14, we read last week that more and more believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Now, we know where this growth is coming from. This early church is on fire. These believers are, are doing things for the Lord. And we read last week in verses 12 through 16 that there are miracles taking place. There are healings. Uh, there's, you know, demons are being cast out of, of others. Wonderful things are taking place. Ananias and Sapphira are even part of the reason for the, the growth of the church. Great fear took hold of the church after, you know, the Holy Spirit, God, struck them down. We also know in Acts chapter 3, where the opposition began, a, a lame man was healed. He was lame from birth, yet he was miraculously healed. But it's the verses that we just read in Acts 5, 17 through 42, that give us more insight as to why the early church kept advancing and growing in the face of persecution. And I think it's amazing that here was a group of early believers, they had no army to back them. No one to back them up, no political influence to really turn to, no powerful friends to make a phone call to, little to no money, and they had no interest in using any sort of force to get the message out or to further their cause. Literally, these early believers were like a chicken about to be plucked, and yet what we read in these verses is no one was able to pluck them. No one. The picture that comes to mind for me is this, this idea of a, you know, an energizer bunny. You put that picture up there. That's kind of the picture that I get of the early church. That's what I think because the apostles we read in these verses and, and the verses that we've already read before Acts 5 and what we're going to read continuing on. The apostles just keep going and going and going like the energizer bunny. And so here in Acts 5, 17, they're thrown in jail. They receive a, a, a beating, you know, for what, what they've done. We learn later in the text. And as verse 41 says, what do they do? They rejoice. They rejoice because, as it says, they were counted worthy of suffering dishonor for the name, the name of Christ. And I think at that point, when they were beaten and they left rejoicing, that's when the Sanhedrin recognized and realized, guys, we're outmatched here. Because anything that they could do to the apostles just furthered the cause of the gospel. The apostles were afraid of no one and nothing. If you put them in prison, it increased their joy. When ordered to stop preaching, they looked at it as an opportunity to show their loyalty and devotion to Jesus. When told to stop preaching, they're defiant of the Sanhedrin's orders. And then they go out and they're sharing Christ in the temple courts, house to house, in the streets, encouraging anyone they come into contact with to listen to the message. And I believe right there, there's a reason why this book is called what it is. Because this book is not the doctrine of the apostles, it's not the theological statement of the apostles, it's not the gospel according to the apostles, what is it? It's the acts of the apostles. Why is that important? Because the book of Acts is all about the apostles, the disciples, the acts that they are doing, the devotion and the dedication that they are showing to Jesus, the determination that they have to spread the gospel far and wide. And after reading a passage like this and passages before this, really what it makes me do is it, it, I look at my own commitment and my own resolve in sharing the gospel, in sharing my faith, 
and it makes my faith seem very flimsy and very flexible. But it's their commitment and their devotion, if you will, that offers to all of us three personal challenges. Three personal challenges, if you will, an an invitation to imitate their bravery and determination. A call to display their fortitude, and if you will, a plea to even, yes, show indifference even in the face of difficult times and pressure that may come against us. Three personal challenges, and the first one is this, for the church, for us, to be encouraged. Why? Because God's in control. Be encouraged. God's in control. God will provide. In Acts 5, what we have is physical affirmation that nothing that man can contrive can thwart the plans of God. Nothing. Their preaching was so effective, the church is growing so fast that the religious rulers did the only thing that they knew to do to stop this movement, put the apostles in jail. And we noticed in the text that it was God who rescues, it's God who delivers the apostles. How? Miraculously, by bringing an angel to release the apostles and to get them out. Now, here's a side note. We don't know how many apostles were in prison. We, we assume that it was, it was Peter and it was John, but the text really doesn't tell us. It could have been two, it could have been four, it could have been eight. Or it could have been just Peter and John. We don't know. What we do know is this. They were ordered to stop preaching, but they refused. Why? Acts chapter 5, verse 29. We must obey God rather than men. And so what do they do? After they're released by the angel, they head to the temple with a smile on their faces, with a spring in their step. Why? Because the miraculous release from prison was proof of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. I will be with you always. The, the miraculous freedom from prison was verification that they truly would be Jesus' witnesses, as he said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. See, let's never forget that as a church, we have much to be encouraged about. And here's why. Because it was Jesus who said to Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, these words, The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Now here's what we tend to forget. We tend to think that we have gates built around the church. No. It's the church that goes out. It's the church that goes and attacks. No gates can stop us from taking down the kingdom of uh, of Satan and his evil kingdom. Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, which is why after being released, the first thing the angel does to tell Peter and, and John is this, in verse 20, go back to the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life, the life that Jesus offers a life that is freely offered to you, and a life that is full and wonderful. In Acts 5, what are we reading about? We're reading about the total and sovereign control of God. That it is God who keeps his word to rescue, to protect, to deliver, and to thwart the schemes of man. It's what Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? The control of God. God will always be consistent with himself and God will always be true to his word no matter what happens in life, no matter what someone brings against us. John MacArthur said it this way. He said, God's promises are certain and they are punctual. They will be fulfilled in exactly the way and at exactly the time that the Lord has determined and declared. Others cannot thwart God's promises, and he himself will not break them. In every form and to every degree, his word is immutable. And so in Acts, if you haven't noticed already, we're we're in five chapters. If you haven't noticed already, already, God will and he does intervene many times supernaturally, just like this in Acts 5, to do what? to propel his purposes further so that the gospel will continue to spread. 
And what that means for you and what that means for me is this. If you have a prison door that you're longing for God to open, guess what? He has the ability to open it. If you are struggling in your life, if you feel like you've been trying to do the right thing and you've hit a dead end road, guess what? The God who is totally sovereign, totally in control, he can take that dead end and turn it into a brand new beginning for you. If your marriage is hurting, guess who has all the hope that you need? If you're struggling financially, it is God who has unlimited resources and unlimited contacts to help you out. It's why the Apostle Paul said these encouraging words in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Paul said, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Here's my encouragement to you. Be encouraged. Because we have a God who provides, and God will do exactly as he said he will do. He is a God who provides and ultimately has given us all that we need in his son, Christ Jesus. So be encouraged. God is a God who provides because he's in total control. Here's the second personal challenge that we read about in these verses. In this, our personal challenge to us, be bold. Be bold and pursue obedience. Now, I want to be honest with you. Living in the United States today as a follower of Jesus is relatively easy. Now, we we can debate that. We can go back and forth and say, well, yeah, but overall, it's relatively easy. It's easy compared to, unlike our brothers and sisters in foreign countries, if you will, and abroad, that pursue their faith, and ultimately are persecuted for that. And yet we can pursue our faith, we can have a walk with Jesus, um, and rarely come into danger or, or tribulation. And because of that, we are, a, I would say, a very blessed people. We're very blessed. But let me remind you, blessings can turn into curses. And sometimes, even as people of faith, we can become complacent in our walk with Christ. And complacent people are people who quickly forget how important it is and how much people outside the walls of this church need Jesus. Jesus said it this way in John 14, verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And in Matthew 28, before he went back to be with his father, he gave an important commandment. He repeated it in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He said, I want you to go, and I want you to also preach, and I also want you to teach, and I want you to baptize others, and everyone that you come into contact with, I want you to make a disciple. And I want you to go to the ends of the earth in doing this task. And it's the apostles we read in Acts 5 who are fulfilling obediently that command, even in the face of persecution. See, what we need to remember about these verses is this. Luke is not writing this for me to stand up here and preach and for all of us to say, oh, how nice. Isn't that just splendid? No, Luke is writing these words so that, yes, we will read them and ministers will preach about them, but then immediately each and every one of us will begin to, you know, reevaluate the way that we are living out the gospel in comparison to what we are reading about with these apostles and the early church, even in the face of opposition and persecution. Now, I read a story the other day about, you know, two groups of people. There was a group of people that, you know, were on one side and another group of people was on the other side. Jesus was on one side, Satan was on the other, and dividing these, these groups was a, was a fence right in the middle. And Jesus was on one side of the group and he was calling people to him and people would go to him and Satan was on the other side of the fence calling people to him until so all the people were divided except for one man. And one man got on the fence and after a little bit, everyone was gone. Oh, a couple of hours later, Satan returned, and the man that was sitting on the fence said, oh, did you forget something? And Satan looked right at him and said, no, come with me. The man said, yeah, but you forgot. I'm I'm sitting on the fence here. I chose neither you nor him. And Satan said, oh, but what you forget is I own the fence. 
And I think what we forget about in reading the book of Acts from just Acts chapter 5 last week with Ananias and Sapphira. If that should teach us anything, it should teach us we need to get off the fence. That, that we can't have it both ways, if you will. Quit riding the fence. Quit playing both sides. See, for me, it's hard to read these verses in Acts 5 and not appreciate how committed these early believers were. And so when the high priest goes to, you know, the apostles in Acts 5.28, and he says, very clear and very to the point, he says, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. But then he goes on, but here you are in Jerusalem, talking about Jesus, filling everyone's mind. You're trying to make us guilty of this man's blood. Well, now there's a verse right there. Because they were for, right from his own mouth. And as I thought about the high priest questioning Peter and John about this, I thought, well, you know, there was probably a time in Peter and John's and maybe the other apostles' lives and their walk with Jesus that they would have, you know, agreed with this line of questioning. I think there was a time in their life when they thought that, yeah, you, we all need to respect proper authority and this line of questioning is fine. You, you might remember the passage from Mark chapter 9, shortly after the transfiguration, uh, it was the disciples of Jesus who found a man who was casting out demons in Jesus' name. Do you remember what the disciples did to him? They told him to stop. And you know why they told him to stop? Because he wasn't one of them. He wasn't on the official apostles' roll. So they said, you can't preach in his name. You need to stop. But see, that was before. That was before Jesus' crucifixion. That was before Peter's denial. That was before the disciples, the apostles, witnessed the resurrected Jesus and before the church received the gift of the Holy Spirit. But now in Acts 5, what's happened? Everything's changed. And so when the high priest tells Peter and the others, you need to stop preaching Jesus, they might as well have told Peter, stop breathing. Because he was not going to do it. And that's why he went out and he continued to talk about Jesus. I don't know about you, but when I read those verses, here's what I think. That's boldness. That is boldness. And our tendency is to read these verses and say, well, that was then, but this is now. You know, we live in a different time. Of course, there were healings and miraculous things going on. Never forget the same Holy Spirit that was working and empowering the disciples then is the same Holy Spirit who is working and empowering people today. Thank you. That is something we need to grasp from this text. That it's not, well, that was then and this is now. What we read about here can happen now. But it takes us being bold and pursuing obedience I want to be careful in this next statement how I couch it, but I love it when someone steps up to serve. And the reason I say I want to be careful in couching this is because I think today there are too many people who might participate and step up to serve because, well, it's the right thing to do or it's a good idea. Someone else organized something and so, well, it sounds good. It's the right thing to do. I'll, I'll sign up. I'll, I'll serve. What do we see in Acts chapter 5? In Acts 5, the apostles are boldly doing everything they're doing. Why? Out of obedience for Christ. They're giving, they're serving, they're speaking, they're helping directly. It's all directly tied to their faith. Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than men. Acts 5.32, the Holy Spirit will be given to those who obey God. They're serving Jesus. Why? Because Jesus said, if you love me, feed my sheep. They're doing the things they're doing. Why? Because it was Jesus who told them, there are lives that are being held captive by Satan, and you need to go and release them through the message that I'm giving to you. And what we see them doing is what we need to be doing today. See, we serve boldly. Why? Because Jesus first boldly served us. Period. And we love boldly because God first boldly loved us. And so service and getting people to help, sometimes it's kind of like, well, does anyone have a pulse? Good, you'll work. Is that the way it should be? 
We should be serving the way we see the early church serving. Why are they doing what they're doing? Because they're being obedient, and it's because of their love, their deep love of Christ. So we need to be encouraged because God will provide for us. But we also need to be a people who are very bold and and be a people who pursue obedience. And then here's the third challenge in the text, and that's this. Be faithful. Be faithful and proclaim Jesus. I want us, each and every one of us, to, to remember the church's marching orders that we read about in Acts have not changed. They've never changed. They don't change if the world's in turmoil. It doesn't change if Russia in, invades Ukraine. It doesn't change if LCU goes through a difficult time. It doesn't change you know, for you in person if there's something personal going on in your life. The message never changed despite the obstacles and the problems that we are facing. I think it's very interesting. It points back to the, you know, the first personal challenge, but in verses 34 through 39, there's a prominent rabbi by the name of Gamaliel. He is famed for his wisdom and for his moderation, and he, in this text, is cautioning the Sanhedrin, wait before you act. And he's basically saying, if God is not in this, then guys, it's going to fail. But if God is in it, then guess what? You're going to be battling against God. And so in our understanding, what he's saying is this. Let this thing play out. Just let it play out. And what I find so interesting about the dialogue and what I find so interesting about his advice is this. It reminds me that God is in control. That God will provide. Because all throughout the Bible, from the old all the way to the new, what does God do? He's constantly turning heads, changing hearts, instructing people, changing their thoughts and minds of all sorts of people, all for his purposes and all for his his ends. And it's Gamaliel, his advice, it, it wasn't totally wrong. I mean, it was really practical advice. But remember, it wasn't totally correct either, was it? R.C. Sproul said it this way. He said, you know, when you think about Gamaliel's advice, Islam is not of God, and it hasn't failed. It's been around for hundreds of, or for centuries. And then he said, uh, the Gnostic Gnostic heresy that plagued the early church in the second and third centuries, it's still alive and well today. It's just wrapped in different paper. It's still out there. Now, what we see in Acts chapter 5 is this. God is using Gamaliel's words to temper the attitudes of the Sanhedrin. Why? So the gospel will advance. So the message will continue to get out there into the the world. What What should that remind us of? God is in control. See, the gospel has been entrusted to the early church. And what do we read in these verses? They're going out and they're proclaiming it. And nothing is going to stop them. They were obedient, they were bold, they were powerful, they were faithful in proclaiming the gospel message. Look back at verse 42, or yet look at the screen. And, in, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease pro, uh, preaching uh, that uh, Christ is Jesus. To me, that is amazing. What a, a testimony of courage. What a testimony of resolve that no matter what the enemy was throwing at them, the gospel cannot be stopped. In fact, it's persecution that tends to increase the boldness of the apostles. I want to read this uh, for you. It's from John Stott. John Stott said this. He said, The devil has never given up the attempt to destroy the church by force. Under Nero, from 54 to 68, Christians were imprisoned and executed, including probably Peter and Paul. Domitian, from 81 to 96, oppressed Christians who refused to pay him the divine honor he demanded. Under him, John was exiled to Patmos. Marcus Aurelius, in 161 to 180, believing that Christianity was dangerous and immoral, turned a blind eye to serve local outbreaks of mob violence. Then in the 3rd century, what had so far been sporadic became systematic. Under Decius, 
Thousands died, including Fabian, bishop of Rome, for refusing to sacrifice to the imperial name. The last persecuting emperor before the conversion of Constantine was Diocletian. He issued four edicts which were intended to stamp out Christianity altogether. He ordered that churches be burned, scriptures be confiscated, clergy to be tortured, and Christian civil servants to be deprived of their citizenship and, if stubbornly unrepentant, executed. Stott, speaking of current persecution, continues, and he says, We know that in many parts of the world, the church is severely persecuted, but continues, We do not fear, for it is the church's survival. It was Tertullian addressing the rulers of the Roman Empire who cried out, Kill us, torture us, condemn us, grind us to dust. The more you mow us down, the more we grow. The seed is the blood of Christians. Or as Bishop Festu Convergian said in February 1979 on the second anniversary of the martyrdom of Bishop uh, Janani Loam of Uganda put it eloquently, without bleeding, the church fails to bless. Stott concludes, persecution will refine the church, but not destroy it. If it leads to prayer and praise, to an acknowledgement of the sovereignty of God and of solidarity with Christ and his sufferings, then however painful, it may even be welcome. That, my friends, is the story of the book of Acts. And that, my friends, is the story of the church today. The church has a message and the church has a mission. And both were given to us by Jesus. And whatever else the church does, it must be faithful to both the message and the mission. The church has been given a task. The task to go into all of the world and to preach and to teach about the risen Christ. That was the church's calling, that is the church's calling, and that will always be the church's calling until the Lord Jesus Christ returns again. What Luke is telling us here is this, opposition to the message of Christ can never stop the mission of Christ. So be encouraged. And be bold and obey his commands to go out and be faithful and continue to proclaim Jesus in good times as well as difficult times because God has everything under his control. Let's pray. God, thank you uh, for the wonderful opportunity that you have given to us to be here. God, we are thankful for your grace for your mercy, and we're thankful for this text that we can read about this early church. Father, they were encouraged by the way that you moved and worked in their life. And we see a church that's very bold and very faithful in proclaiming your message. May we be the same no matter what comes down the pipeline for us. In good times and bad, Help us to be people who are bold and faithful, knowing that you have all things under control. Encourage us, God. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today, we are not going to have necessarily an invitation that we have done in the past, but I want to remind everyone, the invitation is always open. And if there is someone here that needs to talk about membership, baptism, a little more about our church and what we believe and why we do what we do around here, you come approach myself or Ethan or Alex or one of the elders if, if you know them. Um, we're going to watch a video in one second, but I wanted to highlight that uh, there is a, a sheet that goes along with my sermon. You'll find it in the back. It's orange, okay? Grab this. It kind of goes along. It talks about the Sanhedrin. It talks a little bit more about Gam Gamaliel. And so you um, grab that. That'll add to your, uh, to your study notes. Um, as we mentioned last week, we are talking about, um, you know, our different missions today. And I'm excited about, uh, about this new mission that we're going to highlight today. I'm just going to draw your attention to the screen. You're going to uh, watch a, a short little video. 
So that is a new ministry that we are beginning. We're announcing it today. Um, it's called Hammerheads. And I just want to go back. If you remember from the video last week uh, when I was talking about, you know, that this church has done an excellent job of, of, you know, paving some roads into our community. But all roads from time to time, they need help, they need repair, uh, more equipment, whatever it may be, more resourcing. But then I mentioned this idea about building some new roads into our community. Well, this is a new road that I am excited about that we are going to be starting here at Jeff Street. Okay, it's called Hammerheads, and it's all about this idea of, of helping, you know, repair homes with, with people that are unable to do that, okay? Um, Todd, why don't, you, why don't you come on up here? This is uh, Todd Henry. Um, many of you might remember Todd from uh, Work Camp for Lincoln. We, as a church, along with several other churches, uh, went in to help Todd uh, with Work Camp for Lincoln, which is all about repairing homes, decks, uh, you know, a lot of wheelchair ramps, things like that. Many of you might remember uh, when I first came here, there was a, a ministry called Together for Lincoln. Remember that? Raise your hand if you're so I can see you're all awake because it's is it hot in here? Or is it just me? Okay. Um, so we had so we had Together for for Lincoln. Todd brought a program to, to Lincoln called Work Camp for Lincoln that was, you know, based on the same thing. And when I found out about that, I talked with Todd and we shared. And I said, man, I've been thinking about this ministry for a long time. It's called Hammerheads, where, you know, men and or women from our church would go out and we will help people in our community. Again, this is a road leading out from the church into our community so we can be the hands, um, you know, the, the feet, the heart, the mind of Jesus to people that, that need our help. Practical um, ministry, okay? And so the, the key on all of this is repair. Now, we're not about building a home where we, we, we can't do that. Maybe down the line, that's what God will, will bring, you know, will do of this ministry. But right now, what we're keying on is just helping people, whether it's uh, widows, single moms, low-income individuals, people that just don't have the ability or the finances to perhaps repair a hole in the wall, fix a board, repair a deck, what, whatever, you know, it, it might be. Um, that's what this ministry, Hammerheads, is all about. And I am really excited what God is going to do with this ministry, how he's going to work through this ministry, and um, how he's going to bless you know, our community because of the, of the ministry, Hammerheads. Um, I've probably said a lot, but why don't you share a little bit about Work Camp for Lincoln and how this can tie in, and, and, uh, or just share your heart. Well, as Michael said... Um... It's been uh, 20 years for me that I've worked with an organization doing work camps all over the United States. It's just been kind of a personal mission of mine to help lead teenagers, three or 400 that go into a community and knock uh, repair jobs out uh, for houses all over the country. And uh, after doing that for 20 years in other people's communities and getting excited about that, I was kind of like, but what about ours and bringing something here? And so in 2021, it was kind of a 20 year dream uh, that we brought one to here, and uh, 200 teenagers came. We worked on 29 homes in one uh, week's time, and uh, we, we prepared drywall, we did guttering, we did painting, we built, uh, I think, seven wheelchair ramps. Uh, it, was, it was really awesome stuff, and it made us aware also of the even bigger need in the community because it was countywide. It wasn't just uh, the town of Lincoln. 
And um, yeah, so uh, the good news is that we took a year off, uh, but in 2023, we're bringing one back. There'll probably be more like three or 400 teenagers coming this time. So we hope to double the number of projects uh, that we're working on. But then, yeah, connecting with Michael, we went to school together at, uh, at LCC back then, and um, really excited because uh, the need is huge. Um, uh, there are so many people that need uh, repairs, uh, even uh, critical weatherization things done, that they've got just uh, in the wintertime, the wind is coming right through their house. Uh, no, we've seen homes with no floors, uh, just down to the studs. Um, uh, just, just really um, being aware that right here in our neighborhoods and stuff, there are things that we can do to make a real tangible difference in people's lives in that way. Okay. Yeah. And, and if you remember last week when we highlighted our food pantry, um, I was going to say Phil Collins, but he wasn't here. Phil Gillen. Uh, Phil Gillen said, you know, that he was a little, little skeptical about, you know, people with, you know, link cards and things. But then he went into several homes and saw the disrepair of many of these homes. And I thought, that's perfect. That's elite because that's exactly what Hammerheads is all about. Now, um, we've got several people, Todd being one of them, that I pulled in to help because he, he did this with Work Camp for Lincoln, and so I wanted some of his advice on this as we began this. But we also have some other individuals that are helping. Zach Davis um, has been kind of on the, the beginning committee to get this started. Uh, Reggie Kirby, he's right in the back, uh, right back there, Reggie. Um, uh, who else? Gary, Gary McCree has, has, uh, has helped. And then, of course, he's not here today, uh, but Gary Hawkins. And so, you know, when someone's gone, they become the leader. Gary's going to become the leader of this thing. Uh, whether he knows it or not, I've already talked with him. But I, I know Gary helps out with our food pantry quite often. But, you know, he, we sat down, you know, early on and said, this is a ministry. He had this on his heart as well. And when I sat down with Zach and Reggie and Gary and Todd, I said, I've been thinking about it. And Gary said, that's exactly what I've been thinking of doing as well. So this is a ministry to, you know, of Jeff Street to help our community to be the hands and the feet to fulfill our mission of bringing people to a deeper relationship with God, but also to remind people we are broken people, and let's just make this a place of grace, helping other broken people. And that's what this ministry is about. So here's kind of the breakdown of it. If you go to our webpage, do we have any pictures uh, will be up on the screen or no? Did we put anything up there? Okay. Well, if you go to our webpage, right you know, on the, on the front home page, there's a card there that says Hammerhead's Ministry, and there's a white button. You click on that, and that'll give you some information about Hammerheads, okay? Then if you scroll down to the bottom, there's another button. If you're needing some repair, we want you to fill out a worksheet. If you know of someone, you go to the webpage, click on those buttons, fill out that worksheet. It'll come to myself and or Gary, and then we'll have a, a couple of guys come out to the place to, you know, to help you know, see if we're able to do the repairs. Now remember, this is not a construction company, and there are multiple jobs that we cannot do. We cannot do, you know, full roofing and foundation, and there are many things that we cannot do. We explain that on the, on the webpage, but there are many things that we are willing to do if people need help, and we're just trying to, you know, to love others, to love on others, and to continue to spread the gospel and, um, and, and reach our, our community with Jesus. So go to the webpage, look at it, think about it. If you know of someone, drive them to the webpage. Um, I'm excited about it, and I, I just pray that, this, that God will do, just do a wonderful thing through this ministry, not just for Jeff Street, but ultimately for, for our community. Um, let me, yeah, thank you, Lenny. Thank you. So I'm excited about that. Let me close in prayer. Uh, what, hang on a second, Todd. <clears throat> Todd, would you want to close us out in prayer? Okay, let me, real quick, let me make a couple of announcements. Connect cards, fill out the connect cards, okay? Uh, drop them in the buckets in the back before, before you leave. Uh, you can go online. We have, uh, you know, the, you can scan the, the, um, the code, the QR code, or you can download our app, okay? You can go to that, download it, get all the announcements. I'm just going to highlight a couple. Iron sharpens iron. Uh, the guys are meeting at the office 7 a.m. 7 on the 19th. That's this Saturday. 
Next Sunday, which is March 20th, our time. Our time is our widow's ministry led by our own Myrna Leith. Um, they are going to be meeting at lunch uh, at 12 noon, followed by a program by Mike and Karen Boer. And then the young adults are also meeting next Sunday evening at 6.30 in the well. And that's it. Todd, pray us out, if you would. God, we love you so much, and uh, we know that you could do um, all this stuff without us, but that you choose to create us, to have a relationship with us, you want to be with us, to love us, to let us be your hands and feet and your voice in this community and around the world. And uh, God, you know the mission of, of Jeff Street and the building roads into the community. And uh, I pray that you would bless the Hammerheads ministry, that it's a new, another road, a pathway to to neighborhoods and to homes of people in this community who, who may not know you or have but have had a bad experience with the church or are just hurting and that it just opens up conversation that uh, an opportunity to uh, do an act of service with no strings attached that lets people know that we're, uh, we're all about the acts of the apostles and uh, the acts that your son did on the cross for us. In Jesus' name, amen. One, one other thing. If you were interested in helping to be a part of someone that would go out and repair a deck, fix a, a wall, whatever it may be, there is a table out in the foyer. It'll have hammerheads on it. Sign your name on that because we will need people to help us you know, with, with this ministry. And so if you're interested, if you're handy with the hammer or not, um, sign up, okay? God bless you all. Get out of here, you crazy kids. <clears throat>
Thank you. 